as today Iran's supreme leader suggested Iran is open to renewing negotiations with the United States over his country's rapidly advancing nuclear program, telling its civilian government there was no barrier to engaging with its enemy. Now, the Ayatollah remarks set clear red lines for any talks taking place under the government of the country's reformist president and renewed his warnings that Washington was not to be trusted. But his comments mirror those around the time of Iran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers, which saw Tehran's nuclear program greatly curtailed in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. It remains unclear, though, just how much room Iran's president will have to maneuver, especially as tensions remain high in the wider Middle East over the Israel-Hamas war and as the U.S. prepares for a presidential election in November. Uh, the U.S. State Department not immediately responding to a request over uh, Iran's supreme leader's comments right there. And this also comes as Israel and Hezbollah continue to trade fire following an exchange of hundreds of rockets overnight Sunday. Both Hamas and Hezbollah are among the proxies for Iran, often carrying out attacks on behalf of the country. To speak more on this, I do want to bring in Ali Reza Jafar Zadeh, who is the deputy director of the U.S. Office of the National Council of Resistance Iran. And Ali Reza, we do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Always a pleasure to be on your show. Yes, and I do want to start off with Iran's Supreme Leader's comments when it comes to being open to speaking with the United States when it comes to its nuclear program. What are Iran's intentions? Well, negotiating with the United States over what? This is clearly a ploy um, that the Iran regime has been using over the years. Um, the goal is to take away the... Uh, uh, this, they wind out of the sails of the international community, of the attention on the uh, serious violations of the Iran regime, that the way that Tehran has been rapidly dashing towards building the bomb. And remember, the Board of Governors of the International Atomic Energy Agency, also known as the IAEA, uh, meets uh, five times uh, a year. And um, the next meeting is coming up September 9th. That's just like two weeks from now. And um, uh, there is a possibility and actually talk about uh, censuring the Iran regime at the Board of Governors. They have the ability to refer the file of the nuclear program, nuclear weapons program of the Iran regime to the United Nations Security Council, imposing sanctions on the Iran regime for their egregious uh, violations. This is exactly what the uh, uh, Board of Governors did back in 2006, referring their file to the UN the Security Council, eventually leading to um, five or six major um, uh, you know, sanctions um, uh, uh, approved by the Security Council. So what does the Iran regime do every time uh, one of these meetings are coming up, and a big one is coming on September 9th, is just like, you know, um, uh, showing some kind of willingness to uh, talk to the uh, either the United States or allow the IAEA uh, back to Iran and and uh, you know showing willingness to cooperate if you would refrain uh, from uh, holding uh, putting sanctions uh, on the regime you know that's the condition and every time that that's exactly the ploy that Tehran has been using over the years um, including the past three four years that the negotiations has been um, on the table. And every time the uh, uh, Board of Governors years, Tehran says, OK, we'll allow the IEA to come in. We're going to allow you to operate some of those cameras that we just shut down before. And then as soon as the Board of Governors meeting is over and Tehran escapes uh, sanctioning, immediately uh, they go into further violations uh, of their commitments. And they take like four or five steps ahead. And then when the time comes for another round of uh, uh, IEA Board of Governors, they either make a promise of taking like one step back or they uh, they just take like one step that is not as meaningful. And then as soon as the, uh, the Board of Governors meeting is over, they take another five, 10 steps ahead. They have been rapidly moving the nuclear weapons program of the Iran regime over the years. They are committed in building the bomb. So it's totally senseless to even pay attention at all 
to any of such uh, promises and instead uh, tell the Iran regime, now is the time to hold you accountable uh, for your egregious violations. You know, the Iran regime is enriching uranium um, uh, up to 60%, which is just one screwdriver's turn away uh, from getting to the weapons uh, grade. This is all in violation of their uh, non-proliferation treaty um, agreements. Uh, so where is the accountability? And, and always the regime has gotten away with it. Now is the time to stop it and hold them accountable. Don't pay attention to any of these ploys and promises. So you were saying that this really is an agenda from Iran saying, hey, look, we're willing to negotiate. And then they just immediately turn around after escaping sanctions and then go back to uh, continuing to build towards nuclear capability. Uh, you know, is the obviously I would imagine the international community is well aware of the tactics by Iran. Do you think that the response to these tactics will change this year, particularly because of the growing tensions in the Middle East and Iran already, uh, you know, attacking Israel? Will the international community respond differently this time around? Well, that's a great point you raised, uh, Stephanie. This, this is different now than all the other years. Uh, but, and I hope that the international community understands uh, that, uh, you know, they, they don't have the luxury of allowing the Iran regime another few months uh, to just rapidly move forward with this nuclear weapons program. And I hope the world has realized that at least since October 7, that the head of the stake of war and terror lies in Tehran. And that Tehran's agenda has been entirely focused on, on the one side, supporting all these proxy groups uh, that, uh, you know, whose agenda is, is war and destruction and, and, um, and uh, raising tensions or building the nuclear weapons, uh, stepping up their missile program, providing drones to, uh, you know, the, the countries in, like Russia to target Ukraine and, and, and getting more resources to suppress their own population inside the country. The other factor that is different now than a few years ago is that there have been several rounds of major uprisings in Iran, uh, dating back to starting basically in 2018. Um, there have been nine rounds of major uprisings in all 31 provinces of Iran, people calling for change, for regime change. And it's not just the intellectuals, it's the poor, the deprived, those who used to be the bedrock of support for the Iran regime are now uh, uh, opposing the Iran regime. The fact that the, uh, the sham presidential elections was widely boycotted uh, by the Iranian people. People have entirely lost hope in any and all of the factions within the regime. They're only looking for change in the street through the uprisings, through protests. And, and that's the reality, and I hope that that is understood by the international community, whether it's say United States or Europe or countries in the region that this is not a regime that is 10 feet tall. Yes, they do have all these proxies. They are spending huge amount of money and resources on their weapons program, nuclear weapons program, missile program. But their, the divide between the regime and the people has actually further deepened. This is a, a very vulnerable regime rejected by its own population. This is a much weaker regime than it was, you know, back in 2015. So now is the time to ratchet up pressure on the Iran regime, don't uh, you know, uh, buy their ploys, and uh, and help uh, the process of regime change by the people of Iran. I'm not suggesting any uh, you know appropriation of money or boots on the ground. None of that is needed. The people of Iran are protesting. They are seeking change in Iran, and and I think with the, all the things as you correctly said, Stephanie, happening in the region, um, now is not the time to just punt the ball. Now is the time to go for the victory because all the elements for change are there. And Ali Reza, you mentioned that there is a growing divide between uh, Iran's uh, political leaders and Iran's civilian population. I do want to ask you this because we have seen growing, uh, strengthening ties, if you will, between Iran and countries like Russia and uh, China. And there's concern that these countries will create that strong allyship, you know, is the international community at a tipping point? And as Iran grows closer to nuclear capability, you know, what are the 
concerns there from your expertise? Well, you know, you're absolutely correct. They, uh, look at the allies of the Iran regime, in addition to the countries you mentioned, um, add to it the uh, Syrian dictator Bashar Assad, the, the Shia militias um, in Iraq, uh, the Hezbollah in Lebanon, and, you know, all of the groups involved in the, in the whole region, uh, the Houthis in, um, in, in Yemen, um, uh, whose agenda for all of them is basically uh, opposing peace and, uh, and promoting war and instability um, in the region. Um, but I, ho I hope that they realize that, you know, none of these things are going to help the regime. Uh, the more the regime spends money and resources on its terrorism, and these weapons of mass destruction, the more it creates dissatisfaction among the Iranian population. Look at the nuclear weapons program. At least $2 trillion have been spent by the Iran regime on their nuclear weapons program. $2 trillion. That's huge for a country like Iran. That's two, two times as high as the cost of the eight years of the Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988. And that's why the divide the, between the people and the regime gets deeper and deeper. You know, Iran is a very rich country. It has uh, the second largest oil and gas reserves in the world, tremendous resources everywhere, including its own human resources. But 80% of the population of the country live below the poverty line. Why? Because the money is drained from the people and, and spent on the things that not only doesn't benefit the people, but suppresses the people and prolongs the rule of the Ayatollahs. And I think the world realizes it, that there is an organized opposition. There is an alternative um, to this regime that has been fighting this regime over the years. There are uh, those elements known as the resistance units inside Iran. These are mostly the young people. A lot of them are female um, who are standing up against the Iran regime. These are the, the ones who acted as the engine for the uprisings in Iran. They're now targeting the uh, centers of repression, trying to show the people that this regime is vulnerable, they're not 10 feet tall. And there is a, a platform, you know, the, uh, known as the 10-point plan for the future of Iran, introduced by the opposition leader, the leader of the NCRI, the president-elect of the NCRI. Her name is Maryam Rajavi. That 10-point plan calls for uh, you know, free elections, separation of religion and state, a free market economy, gender and ethnic uh, equality, religious uh, freedom, peace in the Middle East, and a non-nuclear republic Iran. And that's the platform that has gained tremendous support right here in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, a majority of the House members have endorsed this platform, a significant number um, in a bipartisan way in the U.S. Senate, uh, close to 4,000 parliamentarians around the globe have supported this. So it's not that, you know, you don't know what's going to happen if the Ayatollahs leave or you don't know, you know, what the, what's the future. It's very clear there is organized opposition. There is a platform for a free Iran that would change the face of the whole uh, Middle East. It's just, you know, that notion of thinking that if they give more, uh, you know, concessions to the Iran regime, the regime will change its behavior. That needs to be abandoned because that has haunted Washington and various capitals over the past four decades, hoping that you know more concessions uh, will change the behavior of the Iran regime. It has failed badly. Now is the time to see a totally new policy adopted by the United States and the countries in the Europe. So what would what would that new policy be if economic sanctions, uh, you know, don't improve the situation from your perspective? What needs to happen? Well, certainly um, accountability is the central element of that policy. You need to hold the regime accountable um, for their violations, whether it's the, uh, the killings inside the country, uh, their nuclear violations, their terrorism. Tehran has never paid a price for any of those things. To the contrary, um, it's very weird, but that's the, the case, that Tehran has always been rewarded for its terrorism. They take hostages. Uh, what happens? Well, they get cash, you know, $5 billion, $6 billion, $100 billion cash in order to release those hostages, only to encourage Tehran to go back and take, you know, another five or six or 10 hostages. This hostage-taking business has been going on for four decades by Tehran. Why? Because it's profitable for them. It you know it holds the 
policies of the Western nations as hostage. It gets them money and resources. It, they can dictate to other countries uh, around the world. So why would they abandon terrorism you know, if, if it's profitable for them? And, and, and on the other hand, uh, it's not enough to only just hold them accountable and impose sanctions because they may somehow survive out of it. You need to also empower those forces of change in Iran. You need to speak up against the, uh, the killings in Iran. You need to uh, support those who are fighting, the freedom fighters in Iran who are standing up against the regime instead of, you know, denigrating them. Uh, so that policy change has, you know, two phases. One, building pressure on the regime and sanctions. Um, and then on the second one, uh, expressing support and recognizing the right of the people of Iran to overthrow the regime, recognizing the right of those young, um, you know, girls and boys um, in Iran among the resistance units who are facing the Revolutionary Guards. They need to be, uh, it, it has to be leg legitimate for them to stand up and push back the Revolutionary Guards. That's their legitimate right, right for self-defense. That's missing. And that's why this new policy, whoever is going to be in the White House, um, uh, that they should adopt should include these two um, elements. Ali Reza, as always, we do appreciate you taking the time to join us here on Live Now from Fox. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Always a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very much.